today's top boxing news. Ow! Don't give her that challenge, but she's from. So working with Roxy is excellent. And she's southpaw, so it gives another uh, Amanda Serrano look. So okay, her and Serrano, what do you think? <laughs> oh, but they have beef, apparently. Uh, well, why? I don't know. Uh, she's contacted her and she's told her she's told her hey give me the opportunity you know all the girls that you've been facing you've been really dominating and taking advantage of them i i think that you won't be able to do that to me i'm a world champion i'm, and tough I'm a and lefty I'm... so that's, that's so what would happen if she fights serrano oh, I what round knockout or a decision if you fight knockout, knockout. what round before eight, she, she, she's looking for, for a tough, tough i see in the middle of the fight right <laughs> but, and like in the middle okay Right her Roxy? Yes. Como se llama the Instagram? Bandera Erika Farias. This call out caught me a little bit off guard. What was formerly the number one super lightweight in the world. Super lightweight, that's 140 pounds. Former champion Erica Farias, who's about one in six in her last six. That means she's only won one fight. She's only won one fight out of her last six fights. Two losses to Jessica McCaskill, back to back. A loss to Michaela Mayer. A win over Sandy Ryan, an upset win. Then a decision loss to that same Sandy Ryan. A more recent loss to Mayra Moneo. In her last fight. Call out is a, a bit of a strange call out because for many years Erica Farias campaigned up there at 140 pounds reigned as a champion there very recently she decided to move down don't, move don't, down to don't. lightweight and it seems that she can fight there she can campaign there but Amanda's all the way down there at 126 two divisions south of lightweight I understand that there was a time when Amanda held a 140 pound title but that was a long time ago currently she's undisputed at 126 and she has made it clear that Unless it's for a Taylor fight, she's not going to be fluctuating in weight anymore. I don't blame her. She's making great money doing what she has been doing, where she's been doing it, down there at 126, where she holds all the titles, all the belts. For what reason would she move up in weight for Erica? Because she would have to. I don't think Erica can boil down to 126. That's way too low. She'd be dead on arrival trying to make that way. To do it. To do a fight between Erica and Amanda, as impractical as that sounds, it would have to be Amanda that moves up, but why would Amanda move up? And for Erica Farias of all people, what would Erica have to offer her? Nothing. Makes absolutely no sense, but for some reason, Erica Farias has the undisputed featherweight champion in her crosshairs, even though she herself doesn't campaign at featherweight criticizing amanda's quality of competition and in truth there was a time when i was critical of amanda's quality of competition but i think it's greatly improved since then she had the taylor fight the sarah mafood fight ibf champion the erica cruz fight wba champion we all know how tough she is erica feels that amanda's taking advantage by unifying her division by becoming undisputed champion against the other champions at her weight how's she taking advantage the fighter that she's about to fight for 12 three minute rounds Danila Ramos. That's not a handpick. That's a mandatory. She's got a fighter. This thing don't go down. It don't happen. Erica Farias versus Amanda Serrano. That's not realistic. It's don't go down. What is realistic? For Erica Farias, the former champion, who I still think is a formidable fighter, depending on who she's fighting, what would make more sense for her is perhaps a Carolyn Dubois fight. Now that Erica is campaigning as a 135 pounder, perhaps a 140 pounder for the right money, a Carolyn Dubois fight. Brianna Dixon. At 135, at 147, perhaps Lauren Price. She's already been there and done that with Jessica McCaskill and Sandy Ryan. Lauren needs a name. Lauren needs some rounds. Those fights make sense even though Erica's 39 years old. She's 39, but they make sense even though she's one in six in her last six because she's a lot more experienced than Carolyn, then Rhiannon, then Lauren Price. So there's room for it to be competitive. There's even room for an upset. Erica Farias, as long as she's been around, she's never been stopped. She's never been knocked out. Her going all the way down to 126 or Amanda moving up for her is highly impractical. But her versus some unbeaten up and comer, some unbeaten fighter that needs to fight familiar names and seasoned fighters. That makes a lot more sense at this stage in her career. It appears that Erica is training here stateside instead of her native Argentina. Maybe she could fight unbeaten Olympian O'Shea Jones from right here in the US of A. She needs a name. She needs some rounds. Sure, Erica could use the money. She She's aiming high, perhaps a little bit too high, thinking that Amanda Serrano, of all people, especially at this point in her career, is going to give her the time of day. The bottom line here is... It don't happen.
men's featherweight news, it appears that Luis Alberto Lopez, IBF champion, is seeking a unification belt with Rotisserie Ramirez, the WBO champion, as his mandatory title defense looms. I had my doubts. As to how much or how little Luis Alberto Lopez wanted that Robisi Ramirez fight, apparently, Luis Alberto Lopez is on the clock. clock. For a clock. mandated clock. title defense, the hope is to delay that process. If not, the order to fight altogether for a desired unification belt versus WBO. WBO featherweight champion Rotisserie Ramirez. BoxingScene.com has confirmed that the IBF featherweight titleist was ordered to begin negotiations to next face streaking contendior Raya A. Letters were submitted to representatives for both parties earlier last week, just days after Lopez outpointed California's Joette Gonzalez atop a September 15th ESPN show in Corpus Christi, Texas. Lopez did not look impressive against Joette Gonzalez. Some people thought that Joette won. Now it looks like Lopez is on the hook to satisfy a mandatory challenger. A response was offered by the defending titleist through his manager, alerting the sanctioning body of their preferred plans and for a little leniency on the matter. We know that after successfully defending the title versus Joette Gonzalez this past Saturday, we fully understand we have to fulfill our obligations and fight the mandatory challenger. Hector Fernandez, Lopez's manager and head of Furco Management, noted to IBF President Daryl Peoples in a letter of tape by BoxesScene.com. We would like to ask for a special permission, since we are very interested in unifying a belt with current WBO champion, Robisi Ramirez. If you guys grant us permission, we would like to start negotiating ASAP. Once again, I had my doubts. I saw Luis Alberto Lopez express an interest in facing Lee Wood in a unification match between them. I even saw him calling out Naoya Inoue, who just moved up to 122, one division south of 126. He's not on the eve of moving up again. But up until this point, I hadn't seen Luis Lopez express that same interest in fighting Robisi Ramirez, his top-ranked stablemate, the fellow champion at featherweight. The fight that made the most sense didn't seem like a fight that he was pursuing till now perhaps it's because he's on the hook for a mandatory and he doesn't feel like wasting any time with that japan's abe has won his last six starts the most notable of the lot came in a 12-round unanimous decision over two division titleist kiko martinez in their april 8th ibf title eliminator in tokyo while unification bouts are the primary exception normally granted by the sanctioning body lopez has two things working against him at the moment ramirez is currently due to make a second defense of his WBO title atop a November 4th ESPN Plus show from Lake Tahoe. An opponent is still being finalized, though BoxingScene.com's Keith Eidek reported earlier last week that Mexico's own Rafael Espinoza is the likely candidate. So that's one. Ramirez might be busy, so while you're petitioning the IBF to unify with Ramirez, he might be fighting somebody else at the moment. That's one. Two, the timing of the planned fight raises curiosity as to whether the IBF would be willing to park negotiations for its ordered mandatory for at least another six weeks. Two is the timing. This is an ill-timed petition to delay a mandatory for a unification. Fighters are normally required to commit to the negotiation period once a sanctioning body orders a title fight or eliminator. A filed exception is usually required before the start of that, not after. You can't wait until after they order you to fight your mandatory to file the petition. So you have to wonder if the IBF is going to hold Lopez's feet to the fire. They're very selective these days with what mandatories they order against what champions and at what weight, because you'll notice that at junior middle, they never ordered Jermel Charlo to satisfy his mandatory challenger, and that guy's been mandatory since 2019, since before Jermel even became IBF champion. They weren't just Johnny on the spot with that order, but they're Johnny on the spot with this one. I don't know. They weren't Johnny on the spot with Errol Spence Jr. either back when he was IBF champion. When was the last time that Errol, when he was IBF champion, satisfied a mandatory for them? They weren't Johnny on the spot with him, but they were Johnny on the spot with Joe Cordina. They stripped him. He had to win the title back. As stated, the IBF are very selective these days. Response to all of this. Rotisserie Ramirez, the WBO champion, wants to unify with Luis Alberto Lopez. Champion versus champion. There were four champions at this weight. Two of them are on the same side of the street. That's Rotisserie Ramirez and Luis Alberto Lopez. Lee Wood.
WBA champion. He's over there at Matchroom. And Ray Vargas, Ray Vargas, WBC champion of Mexico. He's over there at the PBC. He's on an island. He's fucked. Lopez versus Ramirez, however, because they're on the same side of the street, that's viable. So there is a prequel to Ramirez and Lopez getting it on. The 29-year-old has to hold on to his WBO title when he returns to the ring on November 4th against a yet-to-be-determined opponent as long as disaster doesn't rear its ugly head. Ramirez would love to fight Lopez as soon as possible. Going back and forth in the media isn't really Ramirez's style. All he wants to do is take care of business on November 4th, have a short and sweet negotiation process with Lopez, and move on to a unification clash in the first half of next year. He stays in the winner's bracket. I like Rotisserie Ramirez to win that fight. Congratulations on your hard-fought victory, said Ramirez on his social media account. It's time to stop talking and give the fans what they want. Cuba versus Mexico, champion versus champion. I'm not taken by Luis Alberto Lopez in spite of his impressive run. I can't say that I see an impressive fighter in him, perhaps beating Rotisserie Ramirez would convince me. What Luis Alberto Lopez has is a lot of sharpness and athleticism in place of where fundamentals should be. And I feel like a fight between him and Rotisserie Ramirez would look a lot like the fight years ago between Prince Nassim Hamed and Marco Antonio Barreria. That same underlying principle, that dichotomy, that flash, razzmatazz, and pizzazz is no substitute for textbook fundamentals. And Rotisserie Ramirez has got them. All he's got to do is take care of business in November, then onward and upward. He can fight Lopez. Lopez seems to have warmed up to the idea that they should unify titles. Do it. I don't know how things are going to go between him and the IBF. Will they pardon him? I don't know. The Lopez versus Ramirez, based on what I've seen so far, I'd edge that fight to Rotisserie Ramirez. You know, Luis Lopez, he's, a, he's an athletic fighter. He's got speed and some pop. But he gets away with a lot. I don't think he'd be able to get away with that with rotisserie. Gets away with stuff. Not always fundamentally sound, and I think we got a glimpse of that in his previous fight with Joette Gonzalez. Preliminary thoughts. I like rotisserie Ramirez for the fight. Even if we're not on the eve of it, what we're talking about is a unification match for some time next year in either the first or second quarter. Likely the second. That's goes to Ramirez. And super middleweight news ahead of this weekend's mega match. Derek James on Charlo moving up two divisions. That doesn't mean you have to gain all that weight. I see the strategy. I really don't follow what everybody's saying because I'm not on the internet like that, Derek James said. But you said those numbers, 64, 65, 63, somewhere in that area. But I think that just because you're moving up two weight classes doesn't mean you have to be at 168 pounds. You have to gain all that weight. I think that his advantage is his size, and I think that you have to maximize what you have, and you don't have to go all the way up. You know, we see smaller guys sparring bigger guys every day of the week. True. And the smaller guys are not getting to the heavier guy's size to be able to deal with them. It's just like, I have something that you don't have. And so, he doesn't have to become that guy to be that guy. And I think, hopefully, that'll be what he understands and knows the night of the fight. So, he's not so heavy. Layman's terms, please. They're doubling down on what they already have because they know they're not acclimated to 168. And they're not going to be after just one camp. So, instead of focusing... Focusing on putting on a bunch of weight, they're going to focus on what Jermel has. And what does Jermel have over Canelo Alvarez? Speed and mobility, I'd say. Speed, mobility, and agility. You've been hearing a lot from Jermel Charlo in reference to movement and how that frustrates Canelo Alvarez, how that takes him off his game. But I think that it's a gross oversight. Perhaps in previous years, movement might have bothered Canelo Alvarez, at least more so than these days. But Billy Joe Saunders, Caleb Plant, these are all moving targets, and he stopped the both of them. That's saying that movement by itself. You have to do more than just move. You have to do more than use the ring. Bernard Hopkins believes the fight against Jermel Charlo will show if Canelo is truly declining or not. Big question around that. Some were surprised that he didn't stop John Ryder. Then again, John Ryder's acclimated to 168. Jermel Charlo is not. John Ryder wasn't out of action as long as Jermel Charlo has been out of action. He didn't have ring rust to shake off. Jermel does. The Hall of Fame fight attempt promoter believes that the answer surrounding Alvarez's possible slippage will be answered this weekend. On the night, Jermel Charlo will take on the heavily popular fighter at 168. 
Charlo is as good as they come. He grabbed every world item at 154 and has promised to do the same at 168. For Hopkins, it's flat out hard for him to detect any slippage in Alvarez's game. Against Charlo, however, Hopkins is convinced that he'll see enough to make the final assumption. This here is really going to test whether or not Canelo is declining or like fine wine if he gets better with time, said Hopkins, the little giant boxing. This fight will prove that one way or another. For better or worse. I maintain my original position that even if there are signs of slippage, even if he is in decline a bit, this version of Canelo Alvarez is still better than anybody that Jamel has fought so far. Outlying factors. This guy's not acclimated to 168 and he hasn't fought in a long while so he's got ring rust to shake off. Those are less than ideal circumstances to fight someone the caliber of Canelo. Attack on styles. Even if you can work the weight situation out a bit, you still haven't fought in a long while. You still haven't fought in a long time and you're planning on moving quite a bit in this fight. One way or another that could deplete your energy reserves, having to move that much because Canelo's gonna close the distance. You're trying to manage it. The second you stop moving, he's gonna close the distance, crowd the pocket, get off punches. Do you remember what he did to Callum Smith? The old Rocky Marciano routine to where he punches the guy on the arms deliberately, he punches the guy on the arms to make him tired, to batter those arms, injure those arms, so they're hard to lift, so it's hard to get off punches. Callum Smith is a much bigger, much bigger man than Jermel Charlo. So Jermel Charlo, he's definitely got to stay on the move, stay on his toes, use the ring for as long as he can. Though I reiterate, even that, that in and of itself is taxing on your energy reserves. Moving around for 12 rounds, trying to move around for 12 rounds. It's intriguing because on one end, there are questions about where Canelo Alvarez is. Is he starting to show signs of decline? But on the other end, there are the intangibles associated with Jermel. These really are less than ideal circumstances to fight somebody like this. This is not Tony Harrison. This is not Brian. Castaño. Even a Canelo Alvarez that's starting to show signs of decline, that's still a better fighter than any fighter that you fought. Kind of like with Keith Thurman and Manny Pacquiao. Manny Pacquiao was so obviously removed from his prime when they fought, but he was still better than Keith. At 40, he still had enough left in the tank to beat Keith Thurman, and at this stage... Canelo might be in decline, but he might still have enough left in the tank to beat Jermel. It's a win-win for Jermel, really. He scores a career-high purse, a career-high payday, in the most sought-after fight anywhere at or around these weights against the most sought-after fighter anywhere at or around these weights. And if he loses and gets knocked out, it's a victimless crime because he's never fought there anyway. Pretty much.